Before I started tonight, I just had a really important message for you guys. I just wanted to tell you how to get to the next one. Before I started, I you get out of that. You get out of it right now. No, don't you. This is Zach Galligan, Billy from Gremlins 1 and 2, and you are listening to the 80s Slasher Librarian. Gremlins, the novelization by George Guype. Chapter 16. Few people needed or wanted to visit the formidable Mrs. Ruby Deagle at her home, and fewer still dared try bearding the lioness in her den. That was just the way Mrs. Deagle wanted it, of course. The fewer visitors, the better. Even her later husband, Donald, though a wealthy real estate dealer, had been a burden to her during his last few years. It wasn't because he had a lingering illness, she just didn't like having him around. He had served his purpose, after all, creating a financial empire that would enable her to live very well. So when he shuffled off, it was more a relief to Ruby Deagle than a tragedy. Alone now with her nine cats, she began her typical evening by pouring food in their bowls, but not placing the bowls on the floor until the cats had purred and meowed and curled themselves around her ankle for at least five minutes. That was their payment for the free food. Obedience. Adoration and humbly acknowledgment of her ultimate power. Laughing, she placed the bowls on the floor and watched them fall over each other in their eagerness to eat. Cats, she said to herself, they're so much nicer than people, and they don't have money problems to whine about. When they had finished eating, Mrs. Deagle would relax before the television, watching her favorite game shows. She especially loved the ones that forced the contestants to utterly degrade themselves in exchange for prizes or money. I wonder what fools are going to expose themselves tonight, she said aloud, clutching her satin house dress closer around her neck. The big old house was chilly, but Mrs. Deagle refused to turn the heat up higher than 55 degrees, even when ice formed at the edges of the windows. Why should I make the oil companies any richer, she demanded. Whenever her nephew, Welton, dropped by with some legal papers and complained about the cold. She also did not enrich the furniture companies, having kept the original pieces bought just after her and Donald's wedding. Those musty chairs and tables had been augmented over the years by furniture taken hostage from families unable to make mortgage or rent payments on time. As a result, the huge rooms, kept dark for economy reasons and piled high with assorted junk, resembled a warehouse containing the contents of unclaimed freight auctions. If others didn't like it, Mrs. Deagle rationalized, it was just too bad. She was comfortable in these somewhat gothic surroundings, and that was all that mattered. Her one concession to modern technology, for even the television was an old black and white model, was a device appended to her stairway, basically a wheelchair attached to a motor and pulley. It had been recommended by Mrs. Deagle's physician so that she would not strain her weak heart by climbing stairs. Although the reason she had the chair was serious, Mrs. Deagle still got something of a thrill when she sat in it, pushed the appropriate button, and automatically ascended to the second floor. 
Although she would never have admitted it, she often manufactured reasons for going up and down the stairs so that she could enjoy the ride. She had already seated herself in the device and was about to flip the switch to up when the doorbell rang. Blast, she rasped. Who can be at the door this hour? Don't people have any regard for others' feelings? She walked slowly to the front door, opened it, and peered outside. It was Mrs. Harris, bundled in an old coat, shivering as she held an envelope in her gloved hands. Mrs. Deagle did not invite her inside. Yes, she asked coldly. I got last month's mortgage payment for you, she said a bit proudly. We sold a few personal items and I'm not interested in that, Mrs. Deagle shot back. I have a bank that handles my business, you know. Yes, ma'am, but it's just that I didn't get the money until after closing, and since you said, if I recall, I said I'd like to have everything that's due me, not everything that was due a month ago. Sorry, ma'am. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Deagle reached out, snatched up the envelope, and smiled archly. You probably won't have to worry about dealing with me much longer, she said, since it's my intention to sell a good deal of my properties to High Tox Chemical. Your place is one. Good evening, leaving Mrs. Harris standing with a decidedly confused and unhappy expression on her face. Mrs. Deagle slammed the door. Returning to the kitchen where a fight had broken out among the cats, Mrs. Deagle cleaned up around the cat dishes, made herself a cup of instant soup to enjoy with her television, and ambled into the dark cavern of worn velvet she called her living room. She was barely settled in her overstuffed rocker when the doorbell rang again. Again? she shouted. This is disgusting. The loser probably stood there for ten minutes screwing up her courage, and now she wants to plead with me to change my mind. Donald was right. All those little people out there are lazy, mindless slugs who are good for only two things, cheap labor and food consumption. As she started toward the door, she made an, an addendum of her own. And the creation of garbage, she added fiercely. He forgot about that. Opening the door, she was greeted by the sound of carolers. A trifle off-key, but enthusiastic. Joy to the world! Mrs. Deagle threw her hands in the air, a gesture accompanied not with the loud Hassana, but a well of misery. Stop! she shrieked. Stop emptying your cesspool into my ears! The young carolers, shaken but determined to win over Mrs. Deagle, continued. The Lord is come, let earth receive her king. Go away, I hate carolers, Mrs. Deagle shouted. Get off my front lawn. Take your whiny voices somewhere else. To the sanitary landfield, go! Her shrillness caused the carolers to lose their concentration and place in the music. The melody began to disintegrate in an untidy fugato of overlapping sounds. That's better, Mrs. Deagle declared, smiling at the silent group. If you just stand in the snow and keep your mouth shut, it's much more enjoyable. She wheeled around and the door slammed behind her. Confused and hurt, the youngsters looked at one another for comfort. No one said anything for a long moment. Let's try the houses in the new development, one of them finally offered. They're young people, real nice, not like this old woman, another added charitably. As the group trudged across the field, they one by one became aware of a member who had not started out with them, much shorter than the others. He or she was hidden by stature and what seemed to be a heavy scarf at first, and then each assumed the new member was one or another caroler's younger sister or brother, who had dressed up in a Halloween outfit and became part of the group. Eventually, when it joined in the caroling, the newcomer's voice generated more attention than its size, shape, or color. Rather like someone singing with the teeth firmly clenched, the words came out blurred and high-pitched, somewhere between the twang of a Jew's harp and the indistinct falsetto of a chipmunk who didn't know the words. Maybe, 
one of the carolers now suggested. It's that kid who's causing the problem. Nah, another replied. It's just Mrs. Deagle. She hates everything. But have you heard how he sings? Sure, but so what? We're not supposed to be the church choir. This is just to make people feel good. Yeah, I guess you're right. Despite agreement that the new kid was not to be criticized because of his, or its, singing, one young man decided he wanted to at least find out who their freelance caroler was. Walking closer to the newcomer, he was surprised when it moved quickly away from him. Hey, the boy said. Don't you want to talk? I just wanted to find out who you are. The small person didn't answer. That's a neat costume you got, but it's the wrong holiday. This is Christmas, not Halloween. Still no reply. I bet I know who you are. Eric Wallman, right? The little person didn't answer. A list of approximately a dozen names of area girls and boys produced a similar lack of reaction. Hey, come here. I want to talk to you. The interloper did not advance, so the young man took off after it. Although the costume kid moved with surprising speed and agility through the snow, the longer strides of the older pursuer eventually brought them within inches of each other. As the young man reached out to grab the mysterious visitor, he was suddenly met with an unseasonably hostile snarl, and a sharp pain slashed into his arm. Ow! He cried out. Looking down, he saw blood seeping through the slashed sleeve of his jacket. More angry than hurt, he cupped his hands to yell after the departing delinquent. You're a lousy singer anyways. We don't want you. Your voice stinks. They had walked for nearly an hour, going from one clear trail of tri prong gremlin footprints to a jambled patch and then, usually via luck rather than skill, onto a clear trail again. To keep both their spirits up and his mind active, Billy continued to talk aloud to Gizmo and himself, planning their next move as they trudged along together. Giz, I just thought of something, Billy said. Water makes you guys reproduce, right? And snow is just frozen water, but snow must not have had any effect on Stripe. Otherwise, this whole area would be crawling with those things. What are they called, anyway? They're sure not Mogwai. They're more like those things Mr. Futterman told me about. What did he call them? Greblies? Gremlins? Yeah, that's it. And to think, I thought he was crazy. Anyway, for water to make you reproduce, it must have to be a warmer temperature? Stripe won't find any water outside like that, so luck is with us. Billy knew he was rambling on as a means of bolstering his confidence, but presenting his thoughts out loud even to Gizmo helped him get them in better order. He remembered once in high school when he had written a report on Sherlock Holmes and had been quite impressed with the legendary detective Rationative Powers. For the most part, at least in those adventures, Billy recalled most vividly, Holmes was able to predict his villain's next move by the simple process of putting himself in his opponent's place. This Billy now proceeded to do with reference to Stripe. Let's see now, Giz, he said. Where would we go if we were Stripe? Considering the rather narrow parameters within which Stripe could operate, the question was not really a very difficult one. Outside, it's dark, and he's free to move about as he pleases, but apparently the snow is too cold to use for reproduction, Billy reasoned. Inside, there's the thing he's probably looking for, warmer water, but most of these houses are brightly lit now. Then there's the problem of getting in. How can he do that? Well, he could curl into a ball and throw himself through a glass window, the way he did back home, but that would attract a lot of attention and he could get caught. Unless he picked a house with nobody home, or he could try to sneak in, say, when somebody else went inside a house. Or if the door was left to open a minute. He had been slightly aware of the carolers singing in the distance for perhaps a quarter hour before it struck him that there might be a connection. Breaking into a faster pace, he headed toward the sound of the voices. This may be a long shot, Gizmo, he said, but if we were Stripe, I think we'd try hanging around those carolers. 
At the worst, they'd help him hide our tracks. And if somebody left a door open while the group was singing, maybe there'd be a chance to slip inside. Anyway, it won't hurt to ask. Uh, maybe they've seen him during their travels. Having convinced himself that he had an excellent case, Billy pulled the knapsack cover down tighter to shield Gizmo from the cold and started to run at a brisk pace. A quarter mile down the road, he caught up with the singers. Hi, he said. I'm looking for a little fella about this high. He held his palm about two and a half feet off the ground. The response was immediate. Yeah, one of the carolers said. We saw him. Is he your kid brother or something? Not exactly. Why? Because he's a creep. Neil tried to find out his name, and he ran away. Then when Neil caught up with him, he pulled a knife on him. Billy looked around. Is Neil here? He asked. No, another fellow said. He went home when he saw how bad his coat was ripped. His arm was bleeding, too. Why are you looking for the creepy midget? Another caroler asked. Because he's supposed to be home now, Billy replied. He saw no reason to alarm them by telling the truth. Which way did he go, anyway? Several pointed toward a darkened building, which loomed as a heavy shadow between two smaller, brightly illuminated homes. It was the YMCA. Don't know why he went that way, one of the carolers said. It's clothes tighter in a clam. Maybe he just, uh, was afraid, another offered. Thanks, Billy said, and tell Neil I'm sorry if the little guy hurt him. As he started to move off, three or four of the young people simultaneously spotted Gizmo peeking out from beneath the knapsack cover and trotted after him. Hey, one of them asked, what kind of animal is that? He's cute. It's a mogwai, Billy replied. Where do they come from? Nowhere around here. Look, I gotta go. Thanks a lot for your help. Waving a quick goodbye, he trotted toward the darkened building, picking up the familiar tri-pronged trail of stripe less than a minute later. Running faster, he followed the fresh tracks nearly all the way around the building until they ended, directly below a broken window. This must be the place, Giz, Billy said, his voice a blend of anticipation and anxiety. As he picked the remaining shards of glass from the lodge so that he could boost himself through the broken window, Billy recalled the uproar of a few months ago, when a typewriter had been stolen from the YMCA office. Some aroused citizens, perhaps overreacting, had proposed that every public building in the entire town be wired with the best anti-burglary devices and patrolled around the clock by armed guards. Others, proud of Kingston Falls' reputation as a safe place to live, took the view that until the theft proved to be more than a solitary aberration, a continuation of normal prudence should suffice. Several invitingly weak locks at the high school and YMCA were replaced, as were broken windows on the ground levels. Now, as Billy pushed himself through the opening, he remembered one highlight of last summer's great security debate among Kingston Falls town leaders. I'm all for spending the money to provide the office areas of these buildings with burglar devices, one councilman had said, but I don't see why we should waste money making the ground floor of the YMCA burglar proof. The only things there are a bunch of nailed down metal lockers, a basketball court, and other non-portable facilities. What are they going to steal anyway? Anyway, the cops patrol that area closely and the neighbors watch the place. Now, as he balanced himself precariously on the ledge, Billy wondered if, despite the weather and poor visibility, someone had already spotted him. If so, he knew it wouldn't be long before he heard sirens. For the people of Kingston Falls prided themselves on their respect for law and order, and were not inclined to look the other way when confronted with criminal activity. Criminal activity, he thought, is that what I'm involved in? He knew such was not the case, but... He had to admit that to an outsider, his actions certainly appeared illegal. What would he say if the authorities caught him inside? No excuse being logical under the circumstances, he would be arrested for breaking and entering. It was as simple as that. He wondered if he would be allowed to receive his Christmas presents in jail. So back out then, he said aloud. It's the last call for chickens. Accepting his own challenge, he gave himself a strong push into the building. Landing on his side in the darkness, he quickly located the flashlight, which rolled out of his pocket and started to get to his feet. 
as he did so, an unearthly treble giggle reverberated through the lower floor area. It sounded close by, but because the hall was so spacious and empty, Billy knew Stripe could be fifty or a hundred feet away. Pausing, he decided to give his eyes a chance to adjust to the darkness before moving ahead. A minute passed. No sound could be heard except the floppy chains of a car passing near the center. Another minute crawled by. Billy could feel Gizmo's warm breath on the back of his neck, hear the slight rustle of material as his arm shifted position against his side. Other than that, nothing. No clawed feet clattering over metal lockers, no more giggling, nothing. Finally, a sound shattered the ghostly silence, not a soft or subtle betrayal of its maker's whereabouts, but a definite and distinct sound one would expect to hear in a facility such as this. A dribbling basketball. Not a basketball being dribbled, Billy amended, but a basketball that had been dropped or fallen and was even now coming to rest. Orienting himself, he moved as quickly as the darkness permitted in the direction of the equipment cage. A part of the ground floor the councilman had forgotten when he'd claimed there was nothing worth stealing here. But the cage was always locked, Billy recalled, and not with some hang-on job that could be sawed or broken off. Arriving at the door, he reached out to touch the bronze square lock, which had always reminded him of the Type 1 C's in prison movies. He pushed gently, then with more force. The door was still locked. Then how? He began to ask himself. A hard object striking him on the head provided the answer. It was followed immediately by a hysterical giggle, very loud and directly above him. <laughs> Swinging the flashlight upward, Billy heard the giggle segue into a shriek of pain and then something that sounded very much like an extended curse in Mogwai language. For a moment, he saw the flashlight beam striking Stripe's red eyes, and as the gremlin's head jerked convulsively backward, he could see that there was a six or eight inch space between the ceiling and the top bar of the cage, too narrow for a human to slide through. It had obviously been an easy maneuver for Stripe. Now that he had broken the darkness, Billy decided to keep the flashlight beam trained on the gremlin for if it got away again, he had little time to think about the consequences of another mistake. A shower of debris made up of every small object in the cage rained down on him. It consisted, as nearly as he could tell while dodging the pieces, of baseballs, nails, screwdrivers, a wrench, an old sneaker, hunks of wood, and everything metallic Stripe could handle. Avoiding the objects as best he could while shielding his head and gizmo from the barrage, Billy somehow managed to keep the flashlight on strike throughout the angry shower. He had no strategy other than to see if he could flush the creature out of the cage and attack it with his sword, a strategy that depended largely on how long the flashlight batteries. Suddenly, the light was gone, a sharp object having struck Billy's hand, causing him to drop it. As the flashlight hit the floor, the plastic front flew off, sending the batteries and bulb assembly clattering in different directions. Billy's groan blended with Stripe's giggle in the abrupt and total darkness. Falling to his knees, Billy spread his palms and began feeling for the component parts of the flashlight. He located the batteries quickly, then the bulb assembly, and finally the top. While he tried putting the thing together in the black void, he could hear Stripe making his escape down the side of the cage, the clawed feet landing with the metallic thump only a yard or two away. Had he not been busy with the flashlight, Billy would have started swinging the sword blindly. So close did he feel to the gremlin. A moment later, with the flashlight operating again, he swung it down the hallway just in time to see Stripe turn the corner. He was headed across the basketball court, his sharp claws scratching noisily on the smooth wooden surface, toward a corner with some small utility rooms and the door leading to the large room containing, oh no, Billy breathed as he broke into a run. The swimming pool! We gotta beat him to that door! Racing at full speed, the light bouncing ahead of him, he noted with a grunt of satisfaction that Stripe had veered off in the direction of the utility rooms. Good, Billy thought. Now we've got a chance at least. 
Having reached the swimming pool doorway first, they could now prevent Strike from making it to the pool until their batteries gave out. But in the meantime, Billy could try to locate the main switches. Here, he said as he shrugged off the knapsack. He put the flashlight in Gizmo's paws so that it shone away from his face, but directly outward from the door. You hold it just like this. Don't move, okay? Gizmo held the light firmly in his paws, gulping thickly as Billy disappeared into the darkness. As he stumbled off, Billy worried what Gizmo would do if and when the main lights were located. The pain would hurt him as much as Stripe, possibly kill him as it had the mogwai that died on the back porch in the sunlight. He paused momentarily, debating on whether or not to go back, and then he plunged ahead. If the lights go on, he reasoned, Gizmo will be able to fall back into the knapsack and avoid the pain. Stripe will be immobilized with pain and I'll be able to finish him off. Sword in hand, he groped his way along the wall, wondering which he would encounter first, Stripe or the light switches. A minute later, after encountering nothing but smooth cold squares of tile with his groping fingers, he began to think the search for either or both was endless. Where are the light switches? He murmured helplessly, looking back over his shoulder to make sure the flashlight was still guarding the door. Although the batteries had waned visibly, Billy reckoned they had a few more minutes worth of life. Realizing that, in despairing of locating the switches, if they existed, in this corner of the gymnasium, he started for the opposite wall. He had gone perhaps 50 feet when looking back toward the pull door to see how much weaker his batteries had gotten, he saw the last act of Stripe's clever strategy. Obviously, having figured out that Gizmo was holding the light while Billy tried to outflank him or locate the overhead switches, Stripe had hugged the wall near Gizmo, creeping slowly toward him while shielding himself in the direct rays of the light. Now, too late, Billy saw the gremlin's unmistakable form. Black, except for the chiaroscuro outline created by the light, in diabolically slow motion, the figure rose high in the air next to Gizmo, a cobra ready to strike its prey. Look out! Billy shouted across the court. Look out, Gizmo, he's... The flashlight fell noisily to the floor and rolled away as a series of growls and tiny yelps echoed through the gymnasium. Heading toward the dim outline of the pool door, Billy literally threw himself into the tangle of bodies. Two simultaneous bolts of pain struck him in the shoulder and side. Swinging his fist in a wild backhand arc, Billy felt it strike a solid object, heard Stripe whine. Lashing out again in the direction of the sound, he landed another blow causing Stripe to disengage himself and scamper into the pool room. No! Billy heard himself shout futilely. As the sound of Stripe's scratchy claws moving across tile grew weaker, Billy hastily retrieved the flashlight and started into the pool room. At the door, he turned off the flashlight. Though he could barely see without it, even in his present state of near panic, he knew that the light must be used judiciously. Not only because it was getting weaker, but because a sudden movement by Stripe in the wrong direction now, a protracted and especially evil giggle told Billy that the worst had already happened. <laughs> Stripe had discovered the swimming pool and its power of illimitable reproduction. He was standing at the far end, hopping up and down lightly, his nose inhaling the heady, aromatic mist rising from the surface, his arms making wide, joyous arcs above his head in the manner of an athlete who has just scored the winning points of the game. Each time he hit the tile floor during his victory dance, the giggle increased slightly in volume, so that he sounded rather like a human bagpipe hopelessly hooked on a single hysterical cord. No, Billy breathed. Oh, please, no. The gentle touch of fur against his hand told him that Gizmo was all right. A bit of good news as he stood helplessly watching Stripe lean forward into the water. Turning on the flashlight, Billy raced to the far end and pointed it into the water. Stripe had sank gently to the bottom of the pool and was lying face down, his arms relaxed at his sides. For a long moment, Billy dared to hope. A gentle rumbling destroyed the hope. Stripe's back was aflame with tiny pods erupting to life 
and spreading across the surface of the pool. Like a giant rolling fungus, they divided and redivided, churning the water into a green froth. The gentle rumbling soon became a roar, a deafening wail of a hundred inhuman voices crying out in pain. Billy watched, fascinated, but only for a moment. Then, grabbing Gizmo, he half ran, half stumbled out of the building. Okay, Slashaholics, you've just heard an early access upload from the Patreon page. On Patreon, you'll get early access to this book and others to be named in the future. All early access titles on Patreon will have weekly chapter uploads that premiere on Patreon before they premiere on YouTube. So, if you want to have early access to Gremlins and other great novelizations and tie-in books before the uploads reach YouTube, head on over to Patreon. Thank you all so much for listening. Hope you're enjoying this book so far. And as always, pleasant dreams! Be sure to subscribe, click that like button, and click that bell. Also, check out the companion channel, the 80 Slasher Library After Hours, for all the great podcast and original content. Links are in the description below. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. You can find those links in the description below as well as well as our merch store and the Patreon page. You can support the channel for as low as $2 per month, get some great stuff like free ebooks, free merch, voice a character, and an audiobook narration, and so much more. Tonight's upload is brought to you by our patrons on the Patreon page. That's...